with uh, Harry Brandt, and uh, <laughs> his career as ascendant. You, you finally got out of the way of, of Richard Price. God, I hated that name. <laughs> sounds um, like Gentile. I, I, uh, I've seen you answer this question before, but uh, I've decided to ask it using um, my wife, who is a genre writer of, of some, uh, some repute. And uh, so Laura Lippmann's take on this was, let me understand this. When he was going to write genre, he had to change his name. Is it that bad <laughs> to write genre? Because I've been doing it for years, and I felt no shame until this moment. Well, I knew Laura was pissed at me. <laughs> um, when I started this uh, book, The Whites, what I intended to do was write a strictly genre book that was going to be an urban thriller, although the problem with thrillers is they're rarely thrilling, just like the problem with horror stories is that they're really horrifying. So. I just thought it was going to be such a departure for me that I wanted to create a persona for this um, separate type of writing I was allegedly going to do. So I came up with this Harry Brandt, and it was a shout out to my first agent, Carl Brandt, who passed away uh, last year. Um, and um, it didn't turn out that way because you know, I, I use this line all the time, so why not use it again? I knew, you know, I knew, I know how to dress down, but I don't know how to write down. Uh, I just, I only know one way to write. I've been writing books for 41 years. I didn't just say that. And um, <laughs> the book kept expanding on me, and I w the characters kept becoming more. And all of a sudden, I was writing about family dynamics in a way that I've never done before. And the book became as much about the family, uh, contemplation and a por portrait of a family, as it did about, oh man, who did that? So it turned out to be a Richard Price novel after all. And it took me four years, just like any one of my cinder block books. <laughs> and at this point, I, um, I regret using the pen name because I was kind of foolish to think I could become another person. That Laura's that still going to be pissed at That me. line about writing down, when you come over for dinner, oh you God, know. No, 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 I'm not going to say it. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. I'm stripping down, stripping down. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I, I very much, um, I, I, I was, to give you some, some small history in, in, this, in this preamble here, uh, Richard and I had the same editor, John Sterling. He's here tonight when I was working on Homicide and he was working on Clockers. And to me, at that time, Richard Price was The Wanderers. That's, I mean, I read that book uh, when it came it out. 1974, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, that was like, holy shit. Yeah, this is, you know, this is otherworldly. And, and then I was a police reporter in Baltimore. And John laid the, uh, the manuscript of, of uh, Clockers on me. Uh, the, 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 not even the uh, reader's copy, but the manuscript. And I remember reading through it and thinking, my God, he got to everything. He got to everything the way it actually is on the, in, the, in the project stairwells, in the corners. This is how it is. And he got to it all. And he got, and he got to it before even journalism got its head around that sort of moment of that, that, that wave of uh, the cocaine epidemic and, and when drugs became sort of every other corner and started devouring stuff. And I, I remember feeling the admiration and envy of this is fiction that this is like the Wanderers to me. I never imagined that it was researched. I imagined it was conjured the way I imagined literature to be conjured. This was literature too. But I remember thinking to myself, this motherfucker actually went out. He had you to know to these. Say that at the Y. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> he, he, I mean, you went out and you yeah, actually, goes to YouTube. Okay. you know, I, I, like I knew these, I knew he knew people who existed. I knew he knew the people of Clockers. Uh, he had trans, you know, they, they had been transformed to literature, but I knew you knew it. And I, I don't think until that moment I had really seriously given thought to the notion that, that novelists love research. And you love research. This is, 
Well, in my life, you know, if I look across the trajectory, I've written eight books before the whites. And the first four books, I was young, and I honestly believed that old thing, write what you know about. And all I knew about was me, because I was in my 20s. You know, what do I know about? And after the fourth book, which is exhausting and a flattening experience, I ran out of me. I didn't know what to do. Um, and I was writing more because I was anxious about getting published than because I had something I really wanted to say. And the book suffered for that because there was no core. And I quit writing for uh, novels for eight years, and I started writing screenplays. And for the first screenplay that made it to into a film, Color of Money, it was about it was a road movie, and uh, <coughs> it was about pool hustlers. And I barely knew how to play pool. Plus, it was not a New York sport. I mean, if you call, on the other hand, they say anything you play where you can still wear your wristwatch is not a sport. So I don't know <laughs> if pool is a sport or golf or something. But I had to go. You know, Scorsese said, well, you got to learn about pool if you're going to write this. See ya. And I went down to Alabama and Virginia and Kentucky, and I hung out with pool hustlers. And all of a sudden, I learned, I can learn stuff. Just because you don't know it, that doesn't, you don't know something, that doesn't mean you can't learn about it and then know something. And I discovered the world of learning, and you, if you have enough imagination and an eye for de detail and ear for how people speak. And if you pick up just enough rudimentary knowledge about this world that you'd know nothing about, you can turn this into art. <coughs> and I wrote Color Money. And then I wrote uh, Sea of Love, which involved uh, police work. And I don't know, I didn't even know a policeman. I didn't even, when I was a kid, I never knew a policeman. But I got hooked up with a guy in Jersey City, and all of a sudden I'm in the back of a police car, all of a sudden I'm going to crime scenes. And once again, I'm learning. And the learning was so exhilarating to me, and I just felt my creative life expand. So after eight years of researching screenplays, I finally came across a story that involved my own experiences having been a coke addict for a couple of years in the early 80s um, that involved all the things I saw through cop's eyes, that involved housing projects that were identical to the projects that I grew up with and built in the same year that had become tiger cages. And I started teaching uh, pro bono at Daytop Village, which was a rehab center, uh, mostly for teenagers in a part of the Bronx where I was born. And all of a sudden, after all of this experience and sopping up things, I realized I wanted to write something that I will not trust to the marketing department of a studio. I will not be nibbled to death by ducks. <laughs> and I finally felt, through the confidence I got through writing screenplays that went place, I finally felt I was ready to go back to books, but I had such an appetite for what I didn't know and so eager to learn what's out there on this particular <coughs> subject. And I was so eager to take the I, there's no I in novel. <laughs> I took myself out of the formula and I just wanted to report a book. But just reporting a book doesn't you can come back and you have stenographers' notebooks and police memorandum notebooks, and they're piled as high as your chin. That's just a bunch of notebooks. The challenge is to take all that material yeah. and to, is that my mom? <laughs> <laughs> Tell her I'm not here. Um, take all that material and forge a shapely allegory for what you saw. And that was Clockers. And then I did it again with Freedom Land, which is, um, David was involved in that to some extent. And I kept doing that. And Lush Life. And, but the, pro the difference with the whites is, and the 
illusion I had that this is going fast is I had such a backlog of memory from going out on the street, hanging out with the police, the police, the people who service both, attorneys, school teachers, social workers. I had such a backlog of memory and incident. I'm going to write this, and I'm not going to hit the field. So of course, I walk around Harlem, where I live, and all of a sudden, I'm getting new stuff. You know, and even when, when I had this stuff down cold, I've been, I was so nuanced in, in my thoughts about these things. It still took four years. What caught me off, on, off, on, off, what caught me by surprise, by, sorry, on, off, by. What caught me by surprise is not the police stuff and how well I could do that, not the street stuff and how well I can do that, but all of a sudden I was writing about a solid family, and I've never been able to write that before. And that was a product of the last six years of my life when I had enough peace in my relationships, in my home, to feel it's okay to write this stuff now. I have confidence and have so much stuff to bring to the party. And it was just new territory for me. So it became less and less a genre book and more and more wasn't exactly, you know, the brothers Karamazov, but <laughs> you know, maybe it was the cousins Karamazov. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, one of our first, uh, the first time I met Richard, uh, as Richard has related elsewhere, it was the night of uh, Rodney King, and we were, uh, it was a play date um, arranged by our editor, by John, who thought we should meet uh, since he was editing both books, and and. Uh, we went to uh, Jersey City, where you had staged the uh, the magical city of Dempsey, yeah, and and uh, for Cockers, and where um, I had acquired this these pages and thought to myself, he knows these people; they, they all exist. They all, you know, and I, of course, am locked into uh, my own crippling disease, which was, you know, I was a newspaperman, so I was uh, everything, Jur you know, journalistitis, yeah, yeah. So everything was everything. I took everything literally. And I think I had a moment of revelation. Richard is showing us, well, this is the bench in the projects that I imagine to be Strike's bench, and this is this. And I was like, yeah, it all, it all comports. And I, I, knew he, I knew there was a Frankie McCord. I knew, I knew everything. I thought I knew everything. And then at one point, I asked you about the, the great dome in the, in the hospital, in the oh, old right. New Deal hospital where the... Yeah. The, the Frank Haig m Memorial... Right, Eternity. right, and w where they were tearing up the metal and throwing it down in the great rotunda, mm -hmm. and it was echoing. And, and I said, "Where is that?" And do you remember what you said? I made that up. Yeah, <laughs> I'm allowed. You know, the problem. The but wait, you didn't say it. Trouble, he didn't say it with as much. Trouble. Yeah, he he said it with a good deal of condescension, like I'm allowed. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. uh, it was. But you get fired, I get paid. Right, <laughs> but there was this moment where uh, it was a revelation for me, but. So now I want to ask you the question, what is more fun when somebody comes up to you and they're so locked into one of the novels that there is a scene that they have bought hook, line, and sinker, and you know it's because you were literally there when that astonishing thing happened in the back of a police car or in an interrogation room, and you think, that's just great research. You know, that, I pulled that through the keyhole of, in the mm -hmm. same way that like a reporter would feel, or is it when somebody is convinced that you've that something you've written has been dead on true and you know and, and it's, it's not. You know, I, you know th the fact is it's, it's a novel. It's, it's not uh, a documentary. And no matter how much I see, uh, I see something that, you know, pardon a cliche, blows my mind, I still got to make it into literature. You know, it's not... A, just because you saw something doesn't automatically make it art. You have to do something with that. And it has to be in harmony with all the billion other things you saw. But it, that's you know, just like the, the little building blocks. And it goes back to that giant jumble of stenographer's notebooks. What are you going to do with all this stuff? Right. But that, I mean, that was such an incredible allegory for the sort of the fallen New Deal of... You know, you constructed a, a, a grand rotunda from which all of Dempsey had been born and had you know, babies after babies after babies. Mm -hmm. And this grand edifice built by the Democratic 
machine mayor. It, it was, it's like this ziggurat, this building. It was built in the 30s because Frank Haig, I am the law, Frank Haig, delivered the Democratic vote to Roosevelt in the 30s. <laughs> and as a thank you, uh, the feds built this massive hospital, which over the years became a nightmare. Um, and was only alive in the, they only had an ER room. I mean, it just fell apart. The building was uninhabitable. They had no money to heat it. And what happened would, and this is a true story, um, the junkies would go in there with chopping carts and they would go from room from room looking for radiators or any kind of salvageable metal. And when they're on a certain floor, they're not gonna walk a pipe down the stairs. So they just threw it out the fifth floor window of the hospital. But the cops knew that any minute that you know, all this uh, metal on the hoof was gonna come out the windows. So they would park their cars waiting for the stuff and they would grab it. And so they could um, cash it in at the salvage yard, which by the way was run by an ex-cop <laughs> who bought all his, you know, all the salvage from the Krakistanis and the pipe heads. And said so they would rip the junkies off by taking the radiator that the junkie laboriously, you know, liberated. And at one point, there were two, I, don't, I think I was told this, but there were two police cars and they would just sit there waiting, you know, for the metal to come out of the air. And some nice piece of copper came down and two cops from two separate patrol cars came racing for it in opposite directions and gave each other a concussion. See? But there was no, so that's the fact, but there was no atrium, there was no right. aviary dome in it. But I was crushed. I, I, I really, but I this wanted is the to thing see that when people, um, I, I got so into reporting that when people would say, oh, I love that scene when so-and-so does that thing with so-and-so, I would almost feel guilty, like, I made that up. There is, I'm a novelist. <laughs> That's my job. Yeah. Now, you get, uh, uh, you get all the credit in the world, and deservedly so, for the dialogue being um, just pristinely correct. I mean, all the dialogue, the cop speak is correct, the street speak is correct. Um, it is, uh, it is uh, you know, n nobody who reads a Richard Price novel um, ever comes away thinking that a line of dialogue is out of place. What I don't think you get a lot of credit for, and what we tried to bring out um, when, we ha when we had you sort of captive for some TV writing, was I, think you, I don't think you get credit for how funny it is, how darkly funny. Well, I find, we talked about this, I find humor is not the same as comedy. Humor is about being, being able to, humor is about provoking recognition in the reader. If you nail a conversation, if you nail a certain archetype and expand on it in a way that makes it fresh, and if somebody reads this and they feel like, oh man, I t utterly believe this conversation, they're gonna smile. Not because it's hilarious, or it might be hilarious, but it's dead on. Recognition is humor to me. If I can write about something in a way that will evoke that grin in people who have had no experience but with the people of Renewa, but intuitively buy it hook, line, and sinker, that's my idea of being funny. But now, I will say this, having taken in a lot of writing and, uh, you know, from whatever this demimond is of, of, uh, of crime or, or poverty or whatever, whatever you want to call uh, where we've spent a lot of, of, of verbiage. Um, there's a lot of people who can internalize the wit and the humor of one side or the other. They can hear how funny the corner boys can be mm -hmm. when they're in their element. And then they lose it with they, they, their They go in the precinct and, the, and, and they find the cops distinctly inhumane and unfunny. Or they start out and the precinct humor is magical to them but they get out on the corner and they just hear, um, th they, don't, they don't hear any wit at all. They, th these are just the chow for, for the heroes. 
of the story? Well, in novels of the 40s and the 50s, sort of like cop novels, you would have writers that were so in love with the cops, probably because they had a fantasy of in a different life I'd be a big policeman. And they're so grateful for hanging out with the cops, they fall in love with them. And there would always be this uh, underlay of racism because they saw like the black and the Puerto Rican perps and, and the street people as humorous as opposed to the cops who were real. So it was um, minstrelly once they left the police and got into, you know, you know, some drunk guy from Harlem. And uh, it was painful to read. For me, my experience is you get sort of embedded. These cops invite you into the house of their life. And you're grateful, and you accepted the invitation. And all you want to do is write faithfully, not passing judgment, but just witnessing, and let them dig their own graves and build their own monuments. But at some point, I want to go to the police. I want to go to the people that live in the world that the police are a constant presence. I want to hang out with them. And I feel just the same way about them. Thank you for inviting me into the house of your life. And I'm going to treat them with the same, you know, open-eyed uh, empathy. You know, I, if I have to tell you this is a bad cop, if I have to tell you this guy's, this guy's a scumbag and deserves to be collared because he's uh, just a bad seed grown to adulthood, if I have to tell you that, it's boring. I just want to present people and let you decide what it's about. What's, what, what, what would be the verdict you most feared and what would be the verdict you most hoped for when a book like Clockers came out or, or The Whites or, 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 or any of these where, where you're journeying from one side to another and, and passing back and forth between that? In terms of the reception of the book? Yeah, I mean, I always... In my own head, my own greatest fear was that the people living the event would call bullshit. So I never wanted Same that thing. to happen. But, I mean, yeah. but like you know now, like, okay, there are moments where, as you say, the cops are building their own monuments, but they're also digging their own graves as characters. So you're going to go back to a Larry Mullane and say, here's the book. Mm -hmm. And you know everything that's in there. And you know that at points the book is very empathetic to what it was like to be a Hudson County investigator. But at the same time, you know it's over with strike and with and with mm -hmm. and you know he's going to re and then s flip it around you know you know that at some point you're bringing that book back to Frankie McCord and saying you know well I can tell you about Frankie McCord it's yeah. a whole story in itself yeah. well my big fear was not anybody's opinion of the people of course I wanted people to read the book and feel like I did them justice you know but that in itself wasn't going to affect the way I wrote I wasn't going to pander to anybody um, and oftentimes, when the book was done uh, and out, and I gave it to you know guys, the people on both sides of the line, I go into a room and they were there, and they'd kind of look at me and like kind of look away and sort of move away, and I'm thinking, oh Christ, they hated it. I, I they feeling like I really betrayed them. They didn't feel like they really betrayed them. They didn't read the book, and they were embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> they're not novelists. You know, they're not, you know, they're not bookworms. <laughs> Listen, I got that reaction from Toni Morrison. I, I sent her, when Clockers came out, I sent her a copy, and me thinking that she can't wait to read it, <laughs> ran into her at a, some kind of, you know, pen gala or something. And I went up to her like, ho, ho, ho. you know, I said, <laughs> hi. And she went, oh, hi. And she was kind of like, you know, skittish with me. And I'd known her for a while. And I'm thinking, she's going to bust me as a white supremacist. She's going to bust <laughs> me as a cultural pilot, another white guy cashing in on the suffering of her people. She didn't read the goddamn thing. <laughs> she's Toni Morrison. You know, what do you think? She has nothing on her, on her uh, end table. <laughs> But of course, you know, 
this is my world. You just all live in it. And so therefore, she didn't like the book. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I sent a co copy of Homicide to all the detectives. And there it was, you know, it was nonfiction. It was their real names in it. So you'd think they would be even more mm -hmm. obsessive about, you know, reading every phrase. And uh, about a, six months after I'd sent the books out, I ran into the real Jay Landsman at a, um, in the courthouse hallway. And I, had, you know, I asked him what he thought. And he said, it wasn't as good as old Yeller. Yeah. And, and then he kept walking, and I realized, I don't think he's read the book. <laughs> That's what my father said about The Wanderers. I wrote it when I was 24, and I was the first kid in my family to go to college. My father was a window dresser for Models, and he drove a cab, and he had a tiny hosiery store, and I actually published a book, which is mind-blowing. And I ran into him, about three months after the book came out, and he, I said, uh, and I was 24, so, and it was uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. I said, come on, let's get a tequila sunrise. You know, it was 1974, so a Harvey, <laughs> a Harvey Wallbang or something. And he said, uh, yeah, I got the book. I read it. I mean, it wasn't like a good book or anything. <laughs> and I said, oh. But <coughs> it's like falling asleep under a sun lamp. You, at the time, you'd go, oh, okay. And then five hours later, you shoot up in bed and your body is like radioactively burning. What? <laughs> you write a book. <laughs> so now, uh, leaving behind my, my, um, the hurt feelings of my wife, oh, okay. um, I'll go back to something else that you've been saying now, which is that you do the screenplays, you do anything else but write novels, but if, you know, for the cash. But if, um, but if you could, you'd just write novels. Mm -hmm. But we only paid you scale for those Wire episodes. You, you, you didn't even make any money off of it. Well, we had no, we had no money on that show. Mm, yeah, that's true. Come on, was there, was there, was there a little no, bit of love? I was getting mad money from the studios, you know, writing yeah, for the other stuff. things. And I was been such an avid fan for two years watching. I knew the characters. And when you and George, I was doing a reading in DC and. David and George came in to the reading and asked me if I wanted to write for season three. And my terror was, these guys think I know everything in the world because I wrote Clockers. I put everything I knew in Clockers. When I wrote Clockers, if, if my brain had pockets, I put everything on the <laughs> table, including my keys, and made big rabbit ears. I was out of new information. I thought these guys, Who's, who are writing this impressive show, expected me to raise the level of the show, and I just feel like the Emperor's New Clothes, you know, I gave well, it all you, you at actually, the office. You asked the classic R Richard Price request, you asked to go for ride-alongs in Baltimore. Yeah. Which we thought was laughable. Like, well, how, I, many, how many more ride-alongs in, Ameri in an American police car do you need, you know? <laughs> but there um, you were. I, s I am so much more happy hanging out than I am actually right. I'll do anything not to write. <laughs> uh, you know, my wife and I go through this, you know, multi-hour ritual in the morning. It's called warming up, uh, AKA fiducering, AKA going online, looking at uh, shoes and rare books. And uh, um, you know, I never answered this email this guy sent me from 2011. You know, <laughs> he's probably wondering, I better answer it now that it's so hard to get to the place of writing because when you start writing, it's like you leave your own body and have to inhabit these characters. You, you, it's, it's like, I always say it's like levitation. And it's worse than jogging. <laughs> um, and it feels so excruciating before you do it and you're thinking about it and you're thinking about it and you think about it. And all of a sudden you start doing it and you go, oh. You know, I always use the example, like, people who jog and hate to jog, so they'll mess around for four hours getting new sneaker laces and um, stretching and, wait, I want to watch this thing on ESPN. Maybe it'll inspire me. And you go out and you, and you jog for a half hour, and then you're done. But you spend four hours getting to the half hour of the job. You know, if I could just eliminate the producer factor. But after a certain number of years, you just accept that's who you are and that's how I roll. And once I get started, I'm in. Is there a moment where you realize 
is it just that the force of deadlines force you to stop, or is there a moment where you realize, I have now researched so far beyond what, what can be contained? I never feel, I, you know, it's the world out there. When do you feel like yeah. you, you've, quote, unquote, got it? Nicholas Pelleggi, when he was doing um, Casino, uh, his nonfiction book about Las Vegas, he said he would be out there and be out there. And when he got to the point where he's asking some wise guy out there, some croupier, a question, and before the guy answered, he was mouthing the guy's answer. Once he could do that, he knew it was time to stop. But it's so addictive for me. I just, you know, an actor gets to try on so many lives and so many different roles. You know, you're uh, Shylock, you're a mafia don, you're a transgender monkey. Y you're anything you want to be, depending on the role. And I just want in my life to experience as many lives as I can. And it's like my mother calling out the window, come in and play. I mean, stop playing, come in and write. Mom, please, it's nice, oh, we're just about, you know, the guys are coming, it's like, I hate to leave the field, but you have to do it, you just, but it, for me, it's really bad. Um, when I was writing Clockers, and John Sterling had about two and a half years of meeting, after we signed the contract, two and a half years of meeting me and being regaled and mind boggled by all these incredible stories from the field. And we finally had one lunch and it was like uh, intervention. <laughs> I told him this happened, this happened and finally he just said, look, I just have one question for you. What's the first sentence of the book? <laughs> At which point, no, 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 I don't know it. I don't know enough about, uh, you know, public defender's office. I don't know, uh, you know, <laughs> enough about the, the public schools or th or the importance of the black church in certain communities. And he just said, "What's the first sentence of the book?" <laughs> and it was like being talked off a ledge. <laughs> I so did not want to hear that. Now, okay, you started out writing very personal novels. Well, the, not so much the Wanderers, but you, you went through a period where you were. Uh, writing what you know and you knew yourself, and, that's what, and it makes perfect sense. Uh, now, you have become known for living in this, in the, in the, on that precipice where cops in the street find each other and these moments happen and, and, and a city is revealed. Mm -hmm. um, is there something about, let's lose the word genre for a moment. I think maybe that is, is sort of the, it's, it's, it, there's, there's all this bad weight, uh, you know, in literature uh, around that word. But is there something really telling about crime and the culture of poverty? Well, crime is it really is. Not, not crime in the P.D. James, oh, who done it? And, no, you know, it was Colonel Mustard in the, mm -hmm. in the you know, not that. But, but, but this stuff that is really examining it, it's sort of where the have-nots touch the haves, where the, where the police yeah. stand. It's where the fault lines of society really are. Did you find something there that without having to preach anything or without having to argue politics, you were nonetheless tapping into something that was... Usually important? what happens, in, in this book or in general? In all, in all in, well, in this book, but, but I mean, you've... Usually what this happens... This is your groove now. Usually what happens is, the first thing that happens when I'm writing a book is to geographically locate myself. I'm in Jersey City. I'm in the Lower East Side. I'm in Harlem. And I know I want to write about this place. And usually what happens is, you know, my, my thoughts about the place are panoramic. And I will wander in that place for a year before story um, suggests itself, and but what I've found, if there's a crime that is a story about the interface of all the disparate sections in the Lower East Side, or in Harlem, or in um, Jersey City, that crime and will, and the orderly investigation that comes out of that crime, first of all, the crime has to speak to the bigger 
uh, social ailment. And I'm not, I'm not a social realist, I'm not a muckraker, but it's a crime that speaks of many things that are not literally in that. Um, once I have that crime, and I have this big messy panorama, that, I mean there were seven different ethnic and social groups on the Lower East Side, and the crime was white kids in the new Lower East Side coming up against black kids from the old Lower East Side, the projects, a misunderstanding that led to a shot fired and headlines all over the place. Once I find that crime, the orderly progression of the police investigating the crime, the witnesses that they see, the family, the victims, um, the perps, who they hide with, the perps families, will give you a spine through that globulous panorama and that becomes your organizing principle. Follow the investigation of the crime and you will pull in everyone in that world. Mm -hmm. So there. So there. Um, I think, are they, are they floating the uh, cards? I saw them being waved at me or maybe they weren't being waved at me. Okay. Um, it's like an est meeting. <laughs> Um, I, I was going to talk about uh, language a little bit, and I had actually circled the thing, but I left it in my bag, so I'm, I'm about to walk off stage and go get it. Well, I'll, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll you do do the voodoo, but I wanted to talk about uh, um, the the Pricean voodoo with street language, which is. Um, it's it, it's what made us happy in the writer. Like when he would turn in a script, we would like read it, and we'd all get to the same pages, and there would be certain phrases that were so improbable yet fixed. They they were supposed to have been said, yet you can't imagine how he thought of them. Um, that w that you would hear the laughter, like at about everyone got to page eight, they got to that line, and there there would always be about eight or ten of them in a sixty-page script, and they were never the obvious but they were never hyperbolic. They were never things that couldn't have been said mm -hmm. on, a, on, a, on a project bench or in a stairwell or in a precinct hallway. They could have been said, yet this was better, if that makes sense. How do you get to that? I'm gonna go steal the one that I right. fell in love I'll with. I'm just gonna hum the theme from the bridge on the river choir until he gets back. <laughs> do, 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 do. All three known as Colonel Buggy's March or <coughs> Hamid Vomit song. Do, 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 sorry. Um, to answer his question, if you go out there, good dialogue is not about perfect authentically, because otherwise the tape recorder can give you good dialogue. What it is, it's about being with someone till you know how their thoughts come out in the, f in the individual fingerprints and snowflakes of how they put words together to express themselves. And, you know, it's just, you're with a person and it, they kind of wash over you. And <coughs> you can, I hate to say it like this, but you can do them. And you're not gonna write exactly what they said. You're gonna write something in the spirit of what they said, because what you wanna catch is how they process ideas into language. And it sounds very anthropological, but it's a lot more quick than that. I always use the example that we were listening to George Bush on TV for eight years. Not everybody's a novelist. Not everybody has a great ear. But if I said to you, take a Shakespeare speech, any speech, um, St. Christmas Day speech, and recite it like George Bush would, you could all do it. And, you know, it's just Osmosis, it's just sort of spiritual osmosis. But it's also this, which is, I came to this place early in the read of, of the Whites, and, uh, and I had one of those moments, it was like a flashback to the Wire writing room when we all got our, our price scripts for that episode, where you get to a line that um, you might even consider it throwaway, in the sense of you're just, you're, doing, you're just doing business and you're trying to get somewhere else. But you know, you're trying to get through this line and be honest with it. But the, the intention of the line is for one human being to say to the other, 
I'm concerned something may happen to you. Or this, I mean, the, the, the one character is basically saying, I'm worried about you, about this happening. It, it's, it's just, I'll just set, yeah, up. set it up. It's a, it's a cop who moonlights as the superintendent of a building. And one of his uh, more alcoholic uh, tenants just won $10 million in the lottery. And he's going around and he's got this big Santa bag filled with Rihanna Rebel perfume, VO, pints of VO cognac, and Muriel Tipperillos or something. And he's giving them out to everybody, just broadcasting the fact that he's hit the lottery. Right. So translated to, um, or strained through what you do so beautifully, I got to this paragraph and it was exactly, you know, nah, man, he's way, way more. People know me. Exactly. Somebody comes to my door three days from now, says there's a smell from 5D. I don't want to find you, see some three-legged alligator torturing you for your ATM code, left you with a screwdriver in your ear. <laughs> yeah. As you, like, well, that's there's a Hallmark card. <laughs> <laughs> like, dear beloved one, get your shit together or you're going to be murdered. Right. Uh, but and in fact, in the course of the book, but never mind. But at every, at every critical moment, where it, it, it could veer into something that's a little bit sentimental or maudlin or where there's, there's even the implication of, there's human care, caring that's draped all over that paragraph of one person for another, even for the derelict. But at every moment where um, sincerity or, or a false sincerity is about to, to raise its ugly head, you come up with a specific, a smell from 5D I don't want to find you in some three-legged alligator torturing you for your ATM code, not for your, cat, you know. No, it tortured you. Yeah. Tortured you for your ATM code and left you with a screwdriver in your ear. I mean. Doesn't everybody talk like Where does the magic come? <laughs> it's just magic. It's because this, I, I, the guy that said that was modeled on somebody that I knew who was a street cop and let's, and some of these cops, like I said before, they're kind of like hip hop kids. Hip hop kids, they have such um, uh, magnetism. They, they just grab every freelance cultural reference from their childhood to the present. So they're not just going to say something, and then they're going to freestyle. They're going to be inspired in the middle of getting the message across and give an example before they even got to the second half of the sentence. And, it, it, and they're just going to like billow like that, you know, from word cluster to word cluster, you know, and it's just, here's a simile, here's a metaphor, never metaphor, I didn't like you, it's just, <laughs> and it, they're just going to blow up. And, you know, like if you listen to hip hop, hip -hop uh, lyrics, this all, this, all this like, where the hell did he get, he's, he's doing a jingle from 1978, and he's using that as a reference, and it's rhyming with something that's going on now. But, you know, they become like, um, they have stick -em all over their heads. And whatever's in the waves out there has filtered down, you know, for the last 25 years. And they use it. Yeah. The, the stuff that always stayed with me um, was th there were moments where you would be engaged in this, like, witnessing this astonishing inhumanity or this, this real tragedy. And then in the middle of it, there would be something so, like, thrown away, so, so palpably human that would be thrown away, either by a cop or by somebody who was being policed. Uh, I remember I was in an interrogation room, and the police were slowly leading this guy on. There had been two guys found dead in the back seat of a car in West Baltimore, and they had gotten the guy to, they'd gotten the guy to put himself in the car and put himself in the rear right seat. And he was trying to say that all you know the people in the front seat had turned around and shot the two people, and he was just a witness. And at some point, the police gently laid in the fact that all the they had bullet holes coming into the guy's sides from the right, so that you know. And he and the the guy in the interrogation room, I'll never forget. He just sort of sighed and he said, "Yeah, I threw him some hot ones, like that." <laughs> and it was like he didn't say I shot them, you know. Because as you often say, and I've heard you say to me, God is not a second-rate novelist. I've heard you. <laughs> but uh, on, on the other hand, he is a second-rate novelist because some of the stuff that <laughs> is real, if you put it in a novel. That's true. That it looks like, oh, please. 
That's true. Well, we have questions, okay. and we're going to answer some of them, or not. Um, how much time did you actually spend with uh, Night Watch detectives researching the whites? And uh, the more notable question, why do you think the NYPD continues to grant you such access? Because <laughs> um, I have them fooled. <laughs> I, you see, this is the thing. It, you know, there's all this stuff about me reporting my novel, but when I actually go back on a calendar and tally the re amount of days that I've actually been out with this unit or those people in the projects, it's always surprisingly little. I think I went out with Night Watch on three nights, and I got permission to do it because um, the guy who was a sergeant in Night Watch that particular night was a friend of mine, and he said, come on, you know, I didn't go through channels. And it, but I made sure to go out on the three hottest nights for Night Watch, uh, St. Patrick's, uh, Halloween, and New Year's Eve. But, you know, so it feels like I've been with these guys, you know, out in the swamps, you know, with big Margaret Mead glasses on. <laughs> and I'm always, I feel like I spend tons of time, but I really haven't ever really spent that much time. It's not like I go out even for a solid couple of days. It's sporadic always. Why, and what was the second question about the NYPD? Why, well, you answered that one first. Why do they let you do it? They don't let me do it because I learned not to go through channels. <laughs> I, you always need a hook. I, you know, my first hook was meeting a cop in Jersey <coughs> State who was into the boxing world, and I was writing a screenplay uh, for Night in the City that was finally made, you know, 10 years after I wrote it. And he was a card-carrying member of SAG, and he was going to advise me on this in exchange that he would get an audition. Well, that never panned out, but he was the only cop I knew when I started writing Sea of Love. So I had this entree through him. It's basically you get passed around. Y you talk to one guy, and it's never because you got permission, because somebody knows somebody that knows somebody that says you're OK. So I talked to this guy, I tell him, what I want to learn, and he'll say, well, come out with us, but, you know, if you really want to learn that stuff, first of all, they have to think, they have to feel like you're good company. They know you're a writer, and I forget the fact that they know I'm a writer, so I always get the best, you know, they're not naive, so even though if I'm not copiously writing in a notebook, and I swear I'm not a journalist or an investigative reporter, I'm a novel, they're talking to a writer, so they're not going to you know, talk to me like they would talk to, you know, the other guys that they work with two hours after I went home. But if I make myself good company and they enjoy the conversation we have, they say, well, you know, that thing that you were asking about, you should really talk to Bobby, you know, in, uh, in the crime scene unit. And I'll, I'll make a call. So I get a call. All of a sudden, I'm with Bobby. I'm, I'm going out with Bobby, I'm seeing things, I'm seeing things, and as I see things, I didn't even know I had questions about this because I didn't even know this existed until I saw it. But it always, you know, leaps into something else that, now that I know about it, I want to know about it. And they'll say, well, you need to hang out with Gene in art forgery or whatever, the scuba team. And basically, I always <laughs> use, Ultimately, you get passed around like a bong. <laughs> and the only requirement is that you, you're good company and you're interesting to them. And once I had movies, once uh, I saw I had did a movie with Robert De Niro, I did a movie with Al Pacino, they, you wrote Sea of Love and it becomes so much easier. And I'm, you know, I always say I'm with them. And all night I'm thinking, oh my God, you walk around with death on your hip. How do you do that? And they looked to me and said, I want to ask you something, and be honest with me. Do you call him Bob, Bobby, <laughs> Robert, or Mr. De Niro? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question. <laughs> now, about that death on your hip. <laughs> so it becomes like a mutual curiosity thing. <laughs> that one got me. That one got me. Um, <laughs> My, what, uh, uh, I gotta get this one story in. Wait, okay. Yeah. Uh, when did you, when did you know your first novel was quote unquote ready, ready for people to look at, ready to try and sell, etc.? 
I didn't. I was um, 22, and I started writing what I thought were short stories about growing up in the Bronx. But as far as I was concerned, I was in the MFA program at Columbia, and I was just a writer, and this is what I was doing for school. It was kind of a goof. For two years of the MFA program, I can go to cocktail parties, and people would say, what, what would I have read of yours? And other than saying, how the fuck do I know? I'm not a mind reader. <laughs> <laughs> um, the answer is, uh, nothing. I could say, well, I'm in the MFA program at Columbia University, which, as you know, is an Ivy League school. <laughs> um, and I just, I didn't know it was ready. I just kept writing these stories for class. And one of the students in the class was Daniel Halpern at this time, who is a poet, but also had this magazine, Antaeus. And I read what happened to be the first chapter of The Wanderers, although I didn't know it at the time. And the class hated it and considered it racist because it was about uh, a gang fight between Italians and blacks, and the Italians won, so it's racist. <laughs> but he came up, he said, uh, I'd like to publish that. And I was in shock. I was you know, just like 22. And I said to him, how much? He said, well, we can't really pay, but you'll get three free copies. I said, <laughs> what I meant was, how much am I paying you? <laughs> <laughs> and it took two years, and I kept writing that, but forgetting about it, and la di da di da And you know, finally, some editors saw the Antaeus thing and reached out to me and took all my collected stories, and I became an author. Um, I, I'm going to conclude not really, con I'm going to semi-conclude uh, by throwing out a, a Richard Price anecdote, which I will then ask him to top. Or uh, I will ask him uh, maybe to interject. I'm sure he can, he'll turn it to, to better advantage than I will. But uh, years ago when you were researching Freedom Land, uh, you, of course, because this is how you play, you went down to South Carolina to, re uh, to, get, to get your head around the Susan Smith case, which was sort of mm -hmm. the prototype for Horrific matricide, uh, the you know, infanticide. Yeah, but she, she drove, in, drove the kids into the lake in the van. So you were down there, and at some point you got wind that there was an, a similar case in Baltimore involving an mm -hmm. arson, a uh, mother who had set fire to her uh, house and killed her kids. And uh, so I get this call, and I, uh, I guess this, you, this constitutes our second play date, mm -hmm. of could you come talk to the detective? Detectives, could, uh, what was the crime scene? So, so we, we basically rolled around. We talked to the detectives. My favorite guy, Terry McLaurin, he was a very mm -hmm. funny detective. And uh, we went to the crime scene, and we stared at the burnt-out row house. Um, and then, because it's Richard Price, and he, you know, at this point, he wrote The Wanderers and Clockers, um, and I got, I got to show off somehow. Um, I was researching the corner, and I, we drove out to West Baltimore. And I, I rolled around the neighborhood that I'd been researching, and I found one of my main characters, Gary McCullough, who uh, he was high as a kite. We pulled him off a corner. He got in the back seat. We chatted amiably for about 15 minutes. And at some point, he used a phrase, which I think is, I, I don't know that it survives. I think that was the guy in the, in, in the hospital that with the big hands like heroin meth. No, no, no. He used that phrase. He used it? Mm, I, I thought that was. I thought it was Gary. Oh, you think it, you met Fat Kurt on that trip? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. All right, so I don't even have the story right. In, in any event, at one point, Richard hears the phrase, the guy says, oh, you, you is an apple scrapper, which in Baltimore, somehow, some, some decaying piece of New York scrapple from the apple, Charlie Park, it means you're an you're a extra dessert. In New Orleans, it would be lanyap. It's like, it's your, your oh, you're special, yeah. you know, at best, at best. At which point, we both heard the word apple scrapple. Right. And we're standing over this guy's hospital bed. And because he was a heroin addict, at a certain point, your hands swell up. And this guy's hands look like catcher's mitts. They were so oh small. Yeah. We're fat. Correct. And he said, yeah, you're the apple scrapple, Dave. And also, we looked at each other like gunfighters. Don't you use that. I'm going to use that. You, you are in my right. city. You do not get to say apple scrapple right. in your book. The parasitic notion of this kind of, of writing, reporting, whatever you want to call it, there was apple scrapple in the middle of the room, and all I could think of is I was showing off. I took Richard to see my guys. Now 
Price has Apple Scrap. <laughs> mm. And he'll probably publish yeah. before I will, the son of a bitch. Snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. <laughs> So top that, mister. I will, and it's not going to be a story about, well, it's going to be a story about research. When I was writing my episodes for The Wire, I went to do ride-alongs with the Baltimore police, not because I didn't know, like, police things, but because they do things different in different places, and just I just wanted to catch the differences so it could sound more like Baltimore than generic urban police force. And I drew this narcotics unit, and he picked up this 15-year-old kid who was serving up bottles on the street, you know, crap. And they put him in the car. And when these kids um, were in the presence of the cops, they turned what we say, we call, into Canadian geese. Which is to say, well, you know, we were watching you for two, two hours out there, uh, Fido. Uh, uh, you were selling bottles right and left, huh? Um, is this the first time you got picked up? Huh? <laughs> and so we got this geese thing. But, you know, these cops are talking. And he looks back and he sees me. And I'm usually referred to that Dustin Hoffman looking motherfucker in the back seat <laughs> with the bad arm. And he goes, who's that? Oh, you're in trouble now. This guy's a writer. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah, he writes for The Wire. You ever watch The Wire? And the kid goes, The Wire? I've seen about four episodes, and I'm truly looking forward to the rest of the season. <laughs> At which point, one of the cops goes, so Fido, you like The Wire, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm topped, but I'll, I'll start one last one because I know that Richard can finish it. So we're writing The Wire. There. At one point, we give, every now and then we would hand Richard something, because again, nobody gives him credit for how funny he is. Uh, it's all just, the, it's so authentic, it's so this, it's so that, it's so, you know, but the wit of the thing uh, is, is, is the poetry that I, that I, that I most love. And so we, we, we come up with something, Richard, why don't you take this into your episode? Uh, you know that game, that sort of, oh God. Mor that morbid little game uh, of, heterosexual males where we sit around a bar and we say to each other, okay, you can screw three women on the face of the earth. You get to pick them, whoever you want it to be, whichever act, you know, Elizabeth Taylor, Butterfield 8, you know, whoever it is for you, three women, you just got to have sex with one guy first. And of course, <laughs> the scam is as soon as the guy names anybody, you know, okay, you know, oh, under any conditions. Yeah, you know, that guy rings your bell. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which he did to me, of course, as soon as, because like, like, say you say Steve McQueen, he's like, oh, Steve McQueen for you, you know. So, so we give him this, and the script comes in, and like I say, we're all reading it, we all get to page eight, and he picked a guy named Gus Triandos, who was a big, lumbering, six foot five. 1950s late Baltimore 50s, Oriole yeah, Baltimore catcher. Baltimore Oriole catcher. He had legs like a stegosaurus. They, <laughs> If, 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 he, if he hit the ball between fielders and he had to run from home to first, you, you would clock him with a calendar. <laughs> it's, a, it's like his name should have been Barney the Purple Dinosaur. You laugh, but he hit, he hit 30 home runs in, I think, 50, yeah. 59. I have to check my baseball he, he, card. He was yeah. an all-star. He, 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 he dethroned Yogi Berra one year as the uh, catcher in the AL. So, but. I had to come up with one of the cops who said, okay, if I can have the Olsen twins, <laughs> I, I'll come up with somebody. And he thought about it, and he said, I'll, I'll uh, do a reach around for uh, Gus Triandos. <laughs> and he said, why the fuck, Gus Triandos? You know, and he's a Baltimore guy, you know. Yeah. He said, well, for years, he had to catch Hoyt Wilhelm's knuckleball and it was impossible to catch. And for years, it drove him insane. I really feel sorry for the guy. I feel like it would be a nice thing to do. <laughs> right. And the other cop says, OK, that's, that's good. Just, you're not going to pull this shit on me. You're not going to say, oh, so you do good. 
forget it. No, you know the. I told you I'm never going to put say a lot anything. of thought into it. That was your line. No, yeah. I respect you. Put a lot of thought into it. it. But it was but out of compassion. It wasn't lust or anything. It wasn't a fantasy. You wanted to bang a stegosaur. <laughs> and he said, "Now I told you that, but you you are not going to tell anybody." No, 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 no. Can I have the Olsen twins now? You got him. <laughs> and within a half hour, he gets out. They get out of the car. In and they were in the precinct, and all the cops are in their cars. And the minute this guy who confessed about Gus Triandos, every cop is going, hey, how you doing? Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and everybody's talking about this guy doing Gus Triandos. But so the, the writers are all, re you the writers are all reading the script, and we're, how did he think of Gus Triandos? How did he think of Gus Triandos? How did, and then all of a sudden it occurs to me, oh my god, what if Gus Triandos is still alive? <laughs> And he was. <laughs> he, he, he was 77 years old. He lived in San Jose. With his sons lived near him. And, and I had to call him. And it, uh, yeah, again. I had to call him. And you know, I'm trying to explain to this very nice old man. And you know, I'm imagining, I'm imagining Gus Triandos, who is like, because the knees, you know, from being a catcher for 20 years, you know, he's walking with a cane. And he's surrounded by these cherubic grandchildren. You know, tell us about. You know, when you were an all-star dad, you know, granddad, and I'm just thinking, I can't, you know, I know he's a public figure, but I cannot do this without his permission. So I get him on the phone, and I'm trying to explain the joke. And he's getting lost. He's saying, wait, am I, uh, so I'm gay? No, no, no. <laughs> no, it's not you, it's not you. And, and I, I called Richard, and I made you uh, come up with an alternative, right? Which, which I'll tell you after you're done, yeah. and then we'll sign some books. Yeah. Yeah, I, so about 9:30, I think. Yeah, okay. <laughs> get to the end of the story. So finally, we sent them the pages. Oh, I'm sorry. We sent them the Richard's pages, and I didn't hear anything for a week. And then Gus Triandos called back, you know, from San Jose, and he said, "I get it. It's really funny." <laughs> he said, and the guy he goes, and the guy feels sorry for me because I had to catch Hoyt Wilhelm's knuckleball, <laughs> and. You know, he said, shit, I feel sorry for him. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, you know, thank you, Mr. Triandos. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, you know, I think I sent you the, the email that said, when you speak of me, speak well for having, <laughs> having done this. Well, listen, you, you talked to a Baltimore legend, so don't complain. <laughs> That's true. So I just, right, okay, it's 838. I just want to tell, he had me write an alternative guy uh, <laughs> if Gus Triandos came after him with a baseball bat. <laughs> At about zero miles an hour. <laughs> um, so I wrote that the <coughs> guy was going to have sex with a 1950s wrestler called the French Angel. Now, the French Angel was my grand. <laughs> the French Angel was stumped and barrel chested and had acromegaly, like giantism. So his head was like half, this, half his body was his jaw. And he, he was a very popular wrestler, but you know, he, he, had, he had a gland disorder. And he was my grandmother's favorite wrestler. <laughs> and so I wrote the explanation like my grandmother told it. He was so ugly, and the, my grandmother's 300 pounds, and five feet tall. He said, you know, the people used to boo him because he was just so ugly, and he's so hard to look at. But I could look into his eyes he was a good man. <laughs> How was he a good man, Bubby? He went to leper colonies all over the world because he felt sorry for lepers. And he wrestled for them. He would put on wrestling shows. He would wrestle for them. And the lepers loved him so much. <laughs> and they couldn't touch him or hug him because they had leprosy. <laughs> so they kissed his shadow. <laughs> and so I did this monologue, and I w you know, it just came down to about 20 years later, I was going, wait, he went to a les leopard colony, and he couldn't touch, who the fuck was he wrestling? <laughs> and on that note, that those were the B pages that never saw the light of day, sadly. There is no Turned topping. A moth routine. There is no topping the French angel or Richard Price. Thank it you very much. It was the Swedish angel also. <laughs> Good.